And now on the line is Carl Balf, the CEO of ActionAid Ireland. Carl, welcome to the programme. Thanks very much for having me. Carl, we're doing this interview today to, in large part, talk about the recent report you've brought out to People versus Austerity. First of all, though, I believe you were only appointed as CEO of ActionAid Ireland last month, uh, so congratulations on the new job. Could, could, could you tell our listeners a bit about your background, please, and uh, what you hope to see happen while you are CEO of the organisation? Great. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, So I've been working over the last 18 years in the fields of human rights development and peace building, um, working with a range of organisations from Christian Aid Ireland, Amnesty International, Oxfam, on development, humanitarian and peace building programmes in Africa, Latin America and the Middle East. And I'm so excited to join ActionAid at this time, this moment in history where we're seeing such huge shifts and you potential different type of future and to join an organization that is so explicitly focused on the human rights of women and children is hugely exciting to me and what I hope to contribute in my time there is to support the already fantastic work underway and to really look at creating systemic change in the lives of the women and children um, whose human rights we are fighting for. Okay, I was looking at the ActionAid Ireland website yesterday and I saw that you have a master's in globalisation. I imagine that was very interesting to study, was it? It was, and actually very relevant to the report that we recently launched looking at how the international system works, looking at some of the kind of the economic, political choices that determine the international system and looking at things from the development and the human rights context as well. Okay, we'll talk about your report now. It's called uh, The People versus Austerity. Everyone or most people in Ireland know what austerity is after the cutbacks we had around 10 years ago. And we still have a lot of underinvestment in some areas in Ireland of public services. I believe this report of yours pertains in particular to 15 development countries. Uh, could you tell me more about it, please? Yeah, certainly. And I mean, I think the word austerity does, in the recent history, mean a lot to Irish people as well. And we understand in very real and practical ways what austerity means. And in this report, we're showing that Ireland's experience of austerity was actually part of this global focus. And in the report that we've recently published, um, which is called The People Versus Austerity, takes a step back at this moment of crisis. So we're in the middle of a profound climate crisis, an economic crisis in terms of the levels of inequality and poverty that we face. And also obviously coming out of the COVID-19 or very much still in the COVID-19 pandemic and how we see inequalities playing out in terms of how we come out of that and who has vaccinations and who doesn't. So the report basically makes a pretty fundamental point that says the way that our international economy is ordered and driven by a major institution um, like the International Monetary Fund or the IMF is essentially quite an ideological approach and it's become such a part of our reality and mainstream that it almost seems like it's beyond question. And what this report does is says actually we very much need to question the type of economy and particularly the impact of the economic models we have on developing countries that are really struggling to provide and meet their citizens' human rights. And the essential point that the report makes is that a core part of this economic ideology that is currently very much present in Ireland and across the globe is that there are certain mainstreams of that. So one is in a time of debt. The first um, course of, of action or recommendation from the IMF is to cut public services, public wages. There's also other elements like reduced taxation for international, for foreign direct investment, liberalisation of the economy. But what the report really says is that this focus on cutting public sector pay is too blunt an instrument and there's no clear rationale and actually it really fundamentally undermines the sustainable development goals, it undermines people's human rights and most particularly it undermines the rights of women and children. I was looking at your website yesterday about your report, your new report and I was a bit shocked to read that this year over 150 countries around the world are 
fate like have austerity at the moment like it's something that's shocking like you know we, we, like we haven't uh, officially our austerity has ended in Ireland even though we still have uh, we, we still have underinvestment in many areas but uh, over 150 countries to be going through that today I just find that unreal you know I, I personally think that there will have to be a reset globally on a lot of the debt held by governments. Like Even the USA, which is supposed to be the leading superpower in the world, has, I believe, a lot of debt that is not sustainable to pay back. Do you agree with this? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's one of the points that we make in the report. We're at a position where none of this is sustainable. And developing countries are having to make this cruel choice between paying off their debt or investing in social um, development and realising, you know, the needs and rights of their citizens. And it's exactly that point that there is this huge inequality. So a country like the US that you've mentioned that has this huge debt has also on the table at the moment, making a real investment in terms of infrastructure and people. And part of Joe Biden's plan is to do this huge investment that will see increases in social spending. And this is not a choice that is available to developing countries. And one of the things, you said the word reset, and I couldn't agree more, and that's the main point that the report is making. We have consistently, over the last 40 years, have undermined the role of the state and we have presented public services as being a problem, as being inefficient. And actually COVID-19 has taught us how much we rely on public services in, you know, and developed countries have invested massively in this. The response to COVID has largely been driven by public services. But in developing countries, it's hugely unequal in terms of the power that they have to make these choices. And one of the interesting things that hap is happening is that the IMF themselves are recognizing that austerity policies do not work. They do not lead to development. They do not mean the economy grows. So in rhetoric, they're recognizing that austerity doesn't work. But in practice, and what our research revealed across the 15 countries that we looked at, countries, regardless of their tax to GDP spend, are being consistently told to cut their public services bill. And the IMF has suggested that this is temporary. But actually, in our research, we highlight that in the majority of countries, they had to cut, they were advised to cut for longer than three years. And for some of the countries that we studied, it was a longer period of six or seven years where they were being told to consistently cut their public service bill. And the impact of this is huge and really real. I mean, in a country like Zimbabwe that we mentioned in our report, teachers are demoralized, they're impoverished, they have to go to neighboring countries. It's one of the lowest rates of pay for teachers globally. And it has a huge on a huge knock-on effect on the well-being and the development of that country because the knock-on effect is that young people aren't receiving the quality of education that they need. We're not seeing the right teacher-to-student ratios and education systems. We don't have enough nurses to meet the needs. And one of the, the challenges that we've laid down is that the IMF looks at this in a very blunt way and they are not assessing the human rights and gender impact of their choices. They're not looking to bodies like the World Health Organization who have clear guidance on the number of nurses needed and the shortfalls there. They're not looking to UNESCO who have clear guidance on education and the types of ratios and um, issues around education. They are making these decisions without a clear rationale and with a, a quite a brutal and devastating impact for those countries. I believe that over the last 20 or so years, maybe a bit longer, in, in a lot of countries in, uh, in developed countries there has been a lot of debt cancellation like I could be thinking a bit too far ahead here but like is there anything to stop the, the same situation happening again like countries developed countries and other countries as well like r ratcheting up all this debt that they owe you know is there anything to stop it happening do you think yeah, I mean, I think it, it again, it comes back to this word reset and there needs to be a recognition that we're going in the wrong direction here. And there are very strong calls across, you know, Africa and other continents to drop the debt and to realize that it is going to force 
countries in developing contexts into this impossible choice. So, I mean, the clear answer to reset this is we have the answer before us. It is to invest in public services because the the impact and the benefit for the citizens and the people who live in that country are huge. It will mean there is greater social investment, there are greater life outcomes. There's a recognition, and one of the things that we call for in the report is that there is, you know, an, an alternative is possible, and it's not a kind of, you know, out there, left-wing alternative, left-field alternative. It is really about saying, the state is crucial. This, we need to invest in the state. The role has to have this redistribute. The state has to have this redistributive role in terms of realizing human rights. So sometimes it's presented as it's the current economic dogma or as it's socialism. And actually, you know, many of us grew up where the welfare state, <clears throat> particularly across Europe, was the bedrock of development within a European context. Countries in the global south should be allowed the same opportunity to invest in their citizens and to invest in their public services. And this would mean the greater realisation of their human rights. So those, those answers are there before us. It's obvious that we can, you know, we're stuck in this dogma. There is space. COVID has taught us what is possible in terms of really making sure that our frontline workers are valued. And what we see from bodies like the IMF is that they overly value infrastructure. But what good is a school without a teacher in it? What good is a road without somebody to maintain it? So we need to shift how we value. And one of the things that we're saying in this report as well is that we need to look at a care-centred approach to our economy. It is not only about the GDP, and that's why the focus on women's rights is so important in terms of the social reproductive role of the economy. If we were looking at things through the lens of recognising the unpaid care work that women do, we would make different economic choices. We would invest in childcare, all of these types of things. They're all these answers are all available before us and there is a growing call across the global south and in the north for these different solutions to come to the fore. Great. No, thank you for the time. And um, yeah, I, I think it is important to remember the issues we faced in Ireland, they're very global and very real and huge issues for developing countries today.